over to our moderator for this conversation, Jean-Claude Broussard. Uh, Jean-Claude is the president and CEO of Digital Promise Global, uh, which is a nonprofit. Yeah, give it up. A <laughs> nonprofit shaping the future of learning by working with educators, researchers, tech leaders, and communities to design and scale innovations that empower learners, especially those who've been historically and systematically excluded. Uh, so we're really excited to have him here. And he's going to be joined on stage by Sal Khan and Julie Young. Uh, Julie is the Vice President of Education Outreach and Student Services at ASU and Managing Director of ASU Prep Academy, uh, which is a leading voice uh, for revolutionizing K-12 online education on the global stage. Um, they're working to create new school models that meet the evolving needs of students. Uh, and under her guidance, ASU, ASU Prep models uh, what the future of school can look like, uh, providing students with a continuous model of education independent of age and grade level barriers. Uh, and she's going to be joined with, by Sal Khan, who is the founder and CEO of Khan Academy, uh, which has revolutionized online learning in the form of a free online platform of providing world-class education to learners all around the world in every subject from K-12 to college and beyond. Um, I definitely remember desperately using Khan Academy to understand physics uh, in high school, uh, so I'm very curious about this conversation. Uh, and you can also find Sal after this doing uh, another session on AI. Um, uh, which will be at 11 uh, on the Brave stage. So definitely don't miss that if you enjoy this conversation. Uh, and so without further ado, please welcome Jean-Claude, Julie, and Sal. Good morning. So let's keep talking about uh, GPT since that seems to be the topic du jour. Um, my two wonderful uh, colleagues here on stage. But let me take perhaps a slightly different spin to all of that. Um, the late Dr. Richard Elmore out of Harvard often talked about the most important relationship in education is between teachers, students, and content. Of course, now we know it really includes families as a fourth, fourth part of, of the stool. So how will AI, how will technology really augment the intelligence of this relationship or not? Julie, start with you. You know, I think I think one of the things that's really incredibly exciting about AI and all that we're learning and all that we're going to learn uh, is that it's 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 going to be such a helper. It's going to help us dig into each and every student, each and every circumstance in such a way that when we talk about personalizing any experience, whether it is through learning, social emotional needs, um, work with parents, what have you is we're gonna actually be able to go to the core. I actually described it to someone the other day like an MRI for learning. And uh, uh, so I think that the, the opportunities are absolutely endless. Thank you. So? Yeah, I, and I, I'll, I'll be giving a much more in depth later today at I, I think one of, the, one of the other stages. But um, you know, this is something if you asked me a year ago, we were exploring, let's call it um, uh, more narrow versions of AI to do things like recommendations. And, you know, Khan Academy, we've always been imagining ourselves as, hey, what, could we start to approximate a good tutor for every child on the planet? Could we start to approximate a teaching assistant for every teacher on the planet? And then uh, in August, uh, Sam Altman and Greg Brockman reached out to myself and our chief learning officer and said, hey, we're, we're training our next run, GPT-4. And I was like, yeah, I've seen three. It's, it's interesting. But they showed it to us, and that changed our thinking on everything. And so, you know, we had gotten under an NDA with them back in August, and then we started having the discussions inside the organization of how can we make this work? Can this get us that much further to being a tutor, et cetera? And um, then when ChatGPT came out, and ChatGPT was only using GPT 3.5, it wasn't using GPT 4, which we were, we were already starting to experiment with, um, and, we're, and, and, you know, I, I remember slacking Greg Brockman at OpenAI, and I'm like, hey, I thought we were going to wait until 2023 to launch this. And he's like, no, we didn't launch anything. We just put a chat interface on GPT-3, and the world seems to, like, it, it, it blew everyone's mind. And, and at first, I was like, oh, that's going to steal our thunder. But I was actually really happy they did it, because it took something that was very imperfect and just threw it out into the world. And it kind of forced everyone to grapple with both what's exciting about it and also a little bit not exciting about it. Um, it also created urgency in education because as soon as like, hey, kids are going to cheat, kids are going to do this, what, you know, how, how we deal with bias, et cetera. So that's when I was able to go to our team and we were already experimenting pretty aggressively with it. And it's like, look, I know there's a lot of things here, but we've got to move forward because if someone doesn't step in and put some guardrails around this, this is, 
we're not going to be able to capture the benefits of the artificial intelligence, and instead you're just going to have a bunch of kids cheating and a bunch of you know, humanities faculty worried about <laughs> what's the future of the term paper or the college admissions essay or whatever. And so um, that was our frame which, for what we now call Conmigo, which is uh, we launched it four weeks ago with OpenAI when they launched um, GPT-4. And the whole principle is mitigate the risks, put guardrails on it. So we took this very seriously. So everything students do, it's monitored by parents and teachers, whoever's the account. We have a second AI moderating the first AI. Every, not only thing is everything recorded, but if the AI detects any shady behavior, parents and teachers are immediately notified. And the spirit of it is it acts as a tutor across everything you do in Khan Academy. There's been a lot of talk about high dosage tutoring after the pandemic. But we haven't seen the results and people have realized because it hasn't been connected to what students are doing in the classroom and it hasn't been happening inside of the classroom. And so when, if you do it after school, the kids who need it most might not show up for it. And so by embedding it in the actual things that students and teachers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we think it has a really good chance of, of accelerating. And then, you know, the, the teacher use case, it's turned Khan Academy in, uh, you know, there's a little toggle where you go from uh, student mode to teacher mode. In teacher mode, it becomes like a teacher's guide on steroids. You can ask it to do lesson planning, create rubrics for you. Pro I mean, it's on and on and on, these things that teachers spend a, 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 a lot of time doing. I'll say, I'll give one last vignette. We've realized that there's so much you can do with these tools that would have seemed science fiction. We're gonna talk about Khan World School at ASU. I did a, this was one of, this is the first school that had access to Conmigo. And um, I did a, a focus group with the students there, a bunch of ninth graders. And one, and there was a bunch of really fun feedback, but there's one young girl, her name is Sanvi. She's from India, she's in India and attends at uh, Con World School at ASU, at ASU Prep. And she said, I was doing, and this just shows what, what the AI can do. Um, she says, I'm, I, I'm doing, I'm reading The Great Gatsby. Jay Gatsby keeps looking at a green light. I kept wondering why. She did a bunch of Google searches. Obviously people have studied this thing before, but she was kind of underwhelmed. It really didn't connect with her. But then she realizes on Conmigo, there's an activity where you can talk to literary characters. And she says, well, I could just ask Jay Gatsby himself. Why? Uh, and so she just goes, she's like, why do you keep looking at the green light? And he's like, ah, old sport. It symbolizes the love for Daisy Buchanan. It is, you know, and, and he just goes off on it. And then she has this long conversation. She apologizes for taking up his time. So <laughs> that, that, we have polite kids at Conroe School. Um, but I think that shows that not only can we mitigate those risks, but this is going to unlock a whole new dimension of learning that was, was science fiction a few months ago. So it's really great to hear not just the fact that you are thinking about what's exciting about Conmigo, but also uh, how to prioritize uh, the educator and, and the experience between, again, teachers, students, and, and content. You know, as a parent um, uh, with three young boys, I, I know they've used Khan Academy, for example. Uh, I know they're looking at GPT, right? At home, they're using PhotoMath to solve math problems, et cetera. Um, I just really would love to make sure, Julie, that the educators too, the schools, because I'm watching systems banning this kind of technology and so really leveraging it. Talk a little bit about how you see this really changing that relationship uh, in the classroom with, with school leaders. Even one of your colleagues talks about, talks about moving from the idea of one teacher to a pod to think about more ubiquitous kinds of learning. So how will that change teaching? So we've talked about personalized learning more in the last couple of years than I think we have in the last 20, although I have always said, you know, 25 years ago we were doing personalized learning before it was cool, but it was all very manual. And the pushback, obviously, that we receive, rightly so, from educators who are struggling with the concept of how do I take these 30 students who are now often in at least 20 different places since the pandemic, and how do I give them a personalized education? And the only way that they're going to be successful is if they use um, you know, uh, technology-enabled tools to be their support. And so I think um, as we think about our educators, we have to train them in an entirely different way, and we're way behind when it comes to that. I think the other thing, too, is um, the technology is going to push us because the kids are going to push us. Um, and that is what has happened in schools for years, is the world around us pushes us slowly into the next millennia. And we're going to see that, I think, now uh, more than ever. 
the other thing I think that's really important to note, um, you know, back in the day, in the old dark ages when we started online learning, um, when you created an assessment, as an example, and, and today, you know, before chat GPT six months ago, I, creating an assessment, one question, is incredibly timely and incredibly expensive. Now I can go to chat GPT and I can say, write me a problem on right angles. And two seconds later, I have it. Or I can say, write me an, a problem on uh, right angles that's about baseball. And two seconds later, I have it. So if we can actually work very closely with our educators to bring this technology into um, the realm of support and teach them how to use them, use it, let them play with it, let them get accustomed to it as opposed to um, uh, keeping it out of the classrooms, then um, I think it's, it, it has the potential to just springboard um, our personalization opportunities for our students and for our teachers. Julie, thank you. I want to stay on that topic for a second, but I want to go back to what you just said. When I taught physics uh, in New York City as a teacher for, for many years, and I remember the days when the TI-83 calculator, the graphing calc, was banned <laughs> in classrooms and on the exams, and a few short years later became a requirement. And I remember having to spend $50 million as the head of high schools and buying that kind of technology. So really thinking about this idea of, of leveraging technology and not, not banning it, I think is an important part of our conversation. So you keep, keep watching the teaching profession, and we have a major challenge right now in the sense that we're watching major attritions in, in, the, in the profession. I think it has a long tail, but the, the pandemic accelerated this idea of the teaching workforce really changing and we're losing teachers. So what is the future, frankly, of, of the teaching profession? What is the new mental model that we have to think about for teaching and learning? Teachers want flexibility. And you know, I, can staff, I could staff four digital schools today and we struggle to staff our brick and mortar schools. And I think that's something everybody should really like take a moment and think about. Um, the teachers are looking for um, something that is far beyond what they had before the pandemic and certainly during the pandemic. We've created, you know, public education is designed to be um, kind of a control, to be a controlled environment, a replicated environment an environment that is a very predictable. And I think we've learned that that is the opposite of, uh, of children and in, in society today. And um, so what our teachers are asking for is flexibility. They're asking for more training. Um, they're asking for more opportunity to um, work together. We are really focused at ASU on uh, a program through our teachers college called the Next Generation Workforce. And what that is, it, sometimes I kind of smile about it because I'm an elementary teacher. And if you are an elementary teacher or were one, you know that teaming and um, centers and collaboration and all of that stuff that now we're talking like is new stuff is, is, has been around forever in the elementary schools. But teaching is a lonely job when you show up at seven o'clock and you go in your room and you're there all day by yourself, you try to grab a bathroom break and you might get to eat lunch. Um, and then, you know, out the door you go. So how do we create an environment where teachers come to school, educators come to school? Number one, they have friends there. Number two, they want to get there. They're excited about their work. Number three, they don't have to know it all. They cannot be um, all things to all people, and, and that's how the profession has been designed. And uh, so it's really focused on how do we lean on the strengths of each individual and come together as a community of teachers and a community of learners so that we can give the best, be our best self, and then uh, have the opportunity for each of our students to get the best of us. And um, so I, 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 I think, Again, teachers, you know, we talk about the pay, that'll never go away, but more importantly than anything, teachers want a really positive, safe environment to work in where they can realize their full potential. Julie, thank you. And so I'm moving over to you for a second. Um, 
when I think about this idea of a team of, of educators uh, teaching a young person, so the teacher no longer is the main protagonist, but just perhaps leading the conversation, but you have a team of people. As a parent, um, I see myself in that role as well, too. So as we think about AI, think about technology, innovations in education, what, what supports do we have to provide to parents to really understand how they can be partners, frankly, in, in, the, in the education or the education of their, their young children? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a couple of general trends. You know, one is what is AI going to do generally to pretty much every, every job? And what it's doing is it, it's elevating. If you were a, you know, an article writer before, now you're going to become an editor and you're going to have a lot more productivity because you're going to be able to use these tools. If you were a software engineer before, now you're going to become a manager, become a software architect. You're going to manage the pieces. You still have to understand how to code as, as the editor still has to know how to write, but you're going to get more scale. Similarly, if a teacher... If you're in a classroom and every student essentially has an artificially intelligent tutor and you as a teacher have one or many, an army, or it feels like an army of artificially intelligent teaching assistants, and it's essentially the same entity, um, I think it allows the teacher to elevate in a, in, a, in a really exciting way and it takes a lot of the traditional burdens off their plate so that they can spend more time for the creative and for the human, human connection, which I think is very powerful. One thing we're really excited about, we've already started using, you know, the AI isn't just about helping the teacher with the lesson planning and things like that and just about helping the students with, it's also about helping the communication between the two parties and the third party, which is the parent. So we, we, we haven't launched it just yet. Actually, we did launch a, a small version. It's gonna launch in a couple of weeks where the, and I actually think this is the future of all web, you know, the old spreadsheet looking dashboards are going to change dramatically in the next six months where the teacher just talks to the AI and says, well, what are my kids up to? And just as they would talk to a teaching assistant. And the AI says, well, you know, some of the kids got a few skills leveled up on their Khan Academy work. Three kids finished that assignment. A couple of kids haven't. And yeah, I helped little Billy with some tutoring over there. Had some good questions. He had some questions about, you know, didn't understand polynomials. And then over there, you know, I pretended to be Jay Gatsby with Sanvi. Had a fun conversation. And, 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 and. And the teacher's like, okay, great. Um, what do you think we should do next? <laughs> and the AI's like, well, you know, a couple of your students have trouble with this concept. What do you, let's plan a lesson together on this and let's put a rubric together. And so it really feels collaborative, like a teaching assistant. And then so your question about the parent, I think parents want to be involved. And this goes back to the teacher bandwidth issue. Um, you know, te teachers want more parent involvement, but it's really hard to have every parent involved and, and you know, have a lens into what, what is going on. And that's another place where I think the AIs are going to be really valuable. You know, I went to uh, some of the teachers at Khan Lab School uh, about a week ago, and I was asking them how the, all the Conmigo stuff, oh, they're like, oh, it's saving us hours, it's so good. And then I was like, what about progress reports? Do you think that would be helpful if, we, if it helped you write? And they're like, are you serious? <laughs> um, you know, they spend half an hour per student writing, per, per term, writing a progress report. If they can get that down, and then if the, if the AI itself knows about the student's history and knows about it, it can help doing that. And then it can be the first line of communication with the, with the parent. So you could have, the parents will feel like they're getting better communication with the classroom, but the teachers are gonna have one less, it's gonna be a less, less, less of a burden on them. Fantastic. Julie, you often talk about um, you know, hybrid learning, online learning. Um, so many of us believe that the future of learning is hybrid. Uh, this idea of everything happening within the four walls of a school is archaic, frankly, is, is dated. How do you answer those who believe that online programming is inherently lower quality? What is the future showing us? They haven't looked at the right program. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. I, I, I think any, um, my advice whenever someone talks about the quality of online education is as with the quality of public schools, there's high quality, there's average, there's low quality, and you have to do your shopping. I think the other thing too, um, the studies definitely show that uh, qu high quality online learning is as effective as face-to-face -face learning, and depending on the students, um, in many cases more effective. And so, um, I, I, there's many different flavors. I often talk about it as a snow cone machine. There are many different flavors and you have to find your flavor. The challenge I think that we went through um, during the pandemic was not new in terms of the last 25 years of online learning. 
Um, if you take a student and you set a student in front of a computer and say, okay, Sal, start working, and the computer says, good job, and moves you on to the next one, or you miss something three times, and it goes, okay, now I'll give you the answer, and moves you on to the next one, um, that is not going to be a, a high-quality learning tool. Uh, high-quality learning with online learning is um, an engaging, communicative, collaborative um, effort that, by the student and by the teacher. The teachers and the students are highly engaged with each other. Um, when students are in uh, a program such as our Con World School or our digital school, um, they will often tell you that they know their teachers better than they ever knew their teachers in their classrooms. And our teachers will say the same thing. And that's because all of a sudden they have this opportunity for personal interaction. Um, they have one-on-one they have -on -one opportunity. They have small group opportunity um, where you don't have 30 other kids in the class waiting for direction. I think AI in the classroom is going gonna, is gonna to augment and mirror that in many ways. Um, but some of that, um, uh, some of the incredible benefits of a high quality online program um, are the, the, the sheer opportunity to be able to have that relationship with that student without class disruptions or bells ringing or, um, you know, name that tune of what goes on in the classroom. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Salkan Julian, thank you.